All right, everyone. Welcome, welcome to our Friday training. This is Sarah Kelly. I'm one of the uh, customer support trainers, and today's topic is contracts. What we're going to do, sort of the format, is presentation first and then time for questions at the end. Uh, we're certainly happy that you joined us, and with that, I'm going to get going. So um, contracts are kind of key to a lot of other elements on the financial side of EDOC, and I'm going to go over and share my desktop now. Um, and so last week we talked about finance, uh, funding, and budget. And so there's a little bit of dovetailing from that into contracts. And so I'm going to briefly kind of touch on those things and, and, and then move into contracts. So, um, so the way you get to, to contracts is obviously through the finance menu. There's a contracts. I am assuming that I already have my funding and budget set up. So they're going to be ready for me to go. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new contract. And um, what we're going to do today is I'm going to kind of touch on all of the different fields. I, I have a feeling that some of you are using contracts, and you're probably using just sort of the bare bones of it. Uh, what we're going to do is talk about sort of the details of each thing and then kind of show how those things go elsewhere. So I'm going to give my contract a number, and we have a crazy numbering scheme on this one. And then this one is going to be my uh, robot implementation contract my description. So you'll notice in the drop down we have two types of contracts, regular and soft cost. We're not talking about soft cost contracts today. Um, so today we're talking about regular contracts. One field that you will notice or you may have noticed on your contracts um, uh, is the classification field. And if these aren't set up for you, you'll probably click on it and there's a little dash there and you think, huh, what the heck is that? Um, this is a field that you can actually work with EDOC to customize for your projects. So in my particular project, I've decided that I want to be able to categorize my contracts by my CM contract, my designer, and my trade contracts. Now what this is going to do is it, it doesn't do anything really to the, the contract itself, but it does allow me to sort and report on things differently and group elsewhere. So and I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, so this is going to be one of my trade contracts, and um, I need to remember my amount. So give me a second while I look at my dollar amount. Uh, that last dollar is tremendously important. Um, and then here's our option for currency. We're going to stick in U.S. dollars. Something new that actually came out in a recent release was um, additional fields on the escrow details. Um, so we're going to add in an escrow account. This is going to be, oh, there's, yes, that's our number, um, escrow, Gentle Benz Escrow Company. I think that's appropriate, um, 123, oh, Peoria, Illinois, apparently. Um, and so what this does, escrow really is, if you have a custom pay estimate or um, a custom document, these are additional fields that we can pull from and create those. So um, out-of-the-box implementation of EDOC, you probably won't be able to take advantage of this. You will be able to sort and report on these with um, with the grids, but this is very useful if you happen to have a custom pay estimate. So escrow details, I'm adding those in. Purchase order number, this is a really a text field. Um, so if you do have another reference, reference number here, let's actually give it a real number. So we're going to, our purchase orders are going to be that. And here's my contract date. Um, I think this one was back. We're, we're getting a little caught up. This is my June 1st contract date. So CO limit is an interesting field. Um, it's a field that you will only see if you have the finance manager or finance reviewer permission. Um, and it really is a reference field. So this would be if you actually wanted to have a um, change order limit on a contract. So these guys who are building my robots actually do go a little nuts. So I want to make sure I have a 20% change order limit on them. Um, it's a big contract, so it's a lot of money there. Uh, original duration. So again, this is a field that we can later report on. Um, my robots are going to take 250 days to build. This next piece is actually really uh, quite useful here. Restrict quantity claimed. This is what, if this is unchecked, this will allow you to overbill on a particular line item on a contract. Um, so keeping it checked means you're only going to be able to bill 100% of a particular line item or you know, the full amount or quantities or units that you've got there. Um, I don't want these robot guys to overbill, so I'm going to leave it to restrict quantity qu claimed. The next option also, you'll, if you notice when you're entering these contracts, um, it does some different things. If I leave it as 
contract retainage held on original contract value. Um, I then have fields where I can say what my CCR retainage amount is, um, which is my, my change orders essentially. And then you'll notice down here my contract retainage. If I click this, I get to say, okay, so my retainage is going to be 10%, and then I set the retainage from on a dollar amount from and to. Um, so again, if we notice, this is contract retainage held on original contract value. So if I want it to be 10% um, from, let's see, 0 to 160 billion, I'm not going to have the full amount, or 16 million, let's see another one there. Um, I can do that, and then I can add another line, and I can say it's going to be 5% for the remaining from that amount. So you can see how it was smart. It picked this up as my two amount, and I'm going to now take the full value of my contract because I'm nice for that last 750000 Um 5%. So that's, that's one thing, one way you can run retainage, um, and I can have my CCR retainage. Let's say change order retainage is going to be 7.5 because I'm, I'm kooky like that. So, so that's one way to run it. Now, notice when I change it to current contract value, my, changes, my, my fields change. So one thing you'll notice on the switch back and forth, when it's original, I have an option to designate a, a specific retainage for change orders. When I go to current contract value, that goes away. And it makes sense because current contract value would be including change orders. The other thing you'll notice down here is contract retainage is now not calculated from and to a dollar amount, it's calculated from and to a percent. So this way I could say I want it as 10% from zero to 50% um, of the contract, and then I want it to drop from uh, down to 5% from 50 to 100. Um, and you'll notice, if I'm going to go ahead and hit save and edit again, and you'll notice those things turned into percentages, so in case that's the type of little annoying detail that bugs you, um, it's okay. It will convert to a percentage afterwards. So two things to kind of keep in mind is how you want your um, retainage calculated. Um, okay, moving on. The next kind of thing that I think really, really oftentimes gets people into a pickle and confuses them um, are is this contractee and contractor. Um, now, if you have the project manager permission, and actually in the, I'm going to save and go over and we'll talk about that real quick. So I'm going to go to my profile and I'm going to look at my particular user. So I'm logged in. I'm Caprica6. Um, I work for the Cylons. And um, my permissions are such that I have the project manager permi permission. If I didn't have the project manager permission, so I'm, this is the permission I'm referring to. Now I'm going to go back over to contracts. Follow me. Um, if I didn't have the contract manager permission, basically I wouldn't be able to choose who the contractee is. It would just be set to my organization. But since I am a project manager on this project, I actually can go ahead and create contracts on behalf of other organizations. So, um, so in this case, I am not creating my own contract because we're the, we, the Cylons, are the uh, construction managers. I'm creating a contract with Greystone Industries for this robot. Or, sorry, contract E would be the Colonial Fleet. Sorry about that, guys. That's, they are the owner in this particular project. And the contractor is Greystone Industries. They're going to actually go ahead and build our, 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 our robots. And there's this other field down here, VIA Architect. This one also is a field that we use for reporting on. Um, so again, if you're creating a custom contract printout or a custom change order and you need to reference the architect or the designer for that matter, um, this is what this field does here. So I'm going to go ahead and set it up. Um, Athena Architects are architects on this project. Now, if I save here and I go ahead and publish it, um, one thing's going to happen. You'll notice, so I am, again, the, the construction manager. Um, what will happen is I won't actually see these um, these numbers on my finances because I'm actually not part of either of these organizations. So I'm not in the Colonial Fleet and I'm not Greystone Industries. So in order for me, the construction manager, to be able to view the financial information for this contract, I actually need to add myself down here to the share finance summary. Now this is the part that people kind of get confused by and um, and I can certainly understand why. So there are two boxes there, or two, two sections here, share finance summary with contractees and share finance summary with contractors. 
So, and the difference is sort of what your perspective is. So as a CM, I want to view this contract as the owner would want to view the contract. So I'm going to share the finance summary with, uh, with contractees. I'm going to add my organization, Asylums, here. Um, that way I see this contract as the owner would see this contract. Now, if Greystone Industries, my contractor, had maybe a very close subcontractor that actually was very much tied into what they were doing, and they wanted to share this contract with them. So basically, somewhat another another organization and have the perspective of the contractor, we would add them to this section down here, share finance summaries with contractors. So that's, that's the difference. It's, it's which perspective you want to have on this contract when you're viewing it from the financial side of things. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and add myself here because if I don't, I'm not going to be able to access this contract because the way contracts work within EDOC is that the only people who have access to view it, to select it in the list of values, are the parties that the contract um, is kind of pulling together. Um, so, so again, right now, you'll notice Colonial Fleet has access to it, Grayston Industries has access to it. Um, Athena doesn't have access. This is just reference. So if we wanted Athena to view this contract, I would actually go ahead. I'm going to add Athena here as well. So now the architect, the construction manager, um, have access to this contract. So I'm going to go ahead and save it. And we're going to take a look and see if there's anything else exciting going on here. Um, well, we're going to go ahead and publish this contract. And... That was, you know, I think I should have probably rockets, explosions going off. That should be way more exciting than, than it was. So now that we've done that, what I want to do is um, we're going to take a look at our contract summary. And um, so I already have a couple of different contracts here. And, but, you know, as I'm looking at this, this isn't really useful to me. I want to um, add a little bit more information. So especially kind of take advantage of some of the fields that I entered in. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the... I, Okay. Um, sorry, I've got a, a flag for my wingman over here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hit the Customize button. And this is true on a lot of these grids within EDOC. Uh, I wanted to point this out is that you can customize them. So you'll notice the default gives me six fields. But you'll notice when I hit Customize, wow, I have a whole bunch of different things that I can add to this. Um, so, you know, I, I had mentioned the escrow, so I could add the escrow account here. Uh, what I'm going to do is I want to add the contractee and the contractor to this. Um, I also want to add in, I could add the CO limit. Might as well do that. And I'm double clicking to add from one column to the other. That's the way. So that's one way you can add to these. The other way is you can actually click on the add and remove. Um, and I think I wanted to add in my classification. Yes. And now, again, on these grids, and we've talked about this in previous sessions too, but I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, if one of you haven't made it to it, I want to make sure you get this too. So if I want to reorder the columns, actually, I'm going to go ahead and save this and just show you. So now I've got this. There's great. These are the columns that I've added in, but this is not how I want this grid to work. I want actually the contractor way over here, and I want classification over to the, so I'm actually going to go back into customize. And like I said, I want contract order to be the first. So I'm going to go up, 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 up. And so you'll notice that I keep moving the field up. Yeah, contract number sounds good to be in the second. I'm going to go ahead and move my classification up. And let's see. Let's put that CO limit next to contracted. And I want contract E back up here too. So this is the way you can reorder columns in these grids. I'm going to go ahead and save it. And now you see this is actually a lot more useful. Um, I can tell who the contractor is, who the contractee is. Um, I had mentioned earlier that field, that classification field that we can customize, we EDOC can customize for you. Um, so if you need to be able to group and sort contracts, um, you can do that with this classification field. So right now I only have one of each. Um, so if I do group these, you'll notice it's going to give me subtotals. Um, you could obviously see this would be super useful if I had a whole bunch of trade contracts. I could actually break them out that way. Um, let me go back and unsort it. And there's that CO limit field. Um, so really wanted to point out with this that it's it's uh, really customizable. Um, and, and that's, like I said, true for many of the grids within EDOC. One thing I do want to point out, because I noticed we've got some folks on the line who are from the Iowa area, if you are working on an Iowa account, contracts work a whole lot differently for you. Um, so if some of this is, 
is looking either a little more simple than what you're used to seeing, that's because we've implemented it slightly differently for Iowa. So, <laughs> sorry guys. Um, okay, so we have that contract in now. Um, what I want to do next is, and it really is kind of setting up for one of our later um, later training sessions, I'm going to go ahead and get into the schedule of values because really as we work through the finance section, um, what Samara had said last week, we kind of moved from left to right. Last week we worked on funding and budget. Oh, actually, that's what I forgot to do to my contract. I forgot to add to funding and budget. So we work from left to right, funding and budget, and then you can set up your contract. And then once you have your contract set, you can create your schedule of values. And, you know, all of those things lead into each other. I can't go ahead and jump into creating a ch contract change request or a change order until I have a contract in place. So kind of think of finances moving from left to right. So while I'm sitting here, I realized, oh, great, I forgot funding and budget. So I'm going to go ahead and unpublish it. I'm going to click Edit. And here are my sections on funding and budget. So this is where I can associate this contract to specific funding. And i got to remember where my funding is. Um, it's that big, big contract. So my funding on this contract is actually split between two different, um, two different funding sources. So I'm going to say it's 10% is coming from this one, and 90% is coming from that one. And then budget, again, um, you know, how we organized our budget is really based on how you want to organize things within within yours. So I'm going to go ahead. This budget is actually only on, going to be on this budget. So um, this is where you can kind of set these associations. And what will happen from here is as you create pay estimates, the pay estimates will look to the contract to determine kind of how to associate the spent money to the funding and budget. So the pay estimate will look to these percentages and go, okay, 90% of this particular pay estimate is going to be applied to um, the COBOL budget and 10% is going to go to, or sorry, funding and 10% is going to go to the Gemini. I'm going to go ahead and set save. And then we're going to go publish again. And, okay, so we've got that going. And actually, why don't we go ahead and take a look at our funding and budget really quickly because we're going to now see that <laughs> um, I've over-allocated my Gemini budget, and that's with the contract I just created. And you'll see the COBOL budget, um, and you can see now allocated. This is my contract, actually. I haven't spent anything against it because I've not put any pay estimates. So you'll now start to see kind of things start to come together. Um, the same is going to be true if we look at my budget here uh, or my funding. Here's Gemini, and there's my allocated. And um, it shows me, again, I've way over-allocated my, my budget there as well. So, um, so again, those things don't start to come into play. You know, last week when we set up funding and budget, great, they're just numbers, but until you start to allocate them, they really don't start to be meaningful. So let's go ahead and create a schedule of values. Now, there are two ways that you can interact with schedule of values, and probably most of you are used to sending EDOC support a spreadsheet to upload, um, and then we probably go back and forth and make sure we get the, the format correct. Um, but if you find yourself needing to create a pretty simple schedule of values, maybe it's five lines, maybe it's ten even, um, you may find it's easy, just easier to create one yourself. So I'm actually going to do that for this particular contract. So I'm going to click New, and I'm going to select which contract it is. It's going to be Greystone Industries. And we're going to call this the Greystone SOV. And I'm going to save it. Once I do that, you'll see it's given me kind of the, the, um, the framework for my schedule of values. So the next piece that I want to do is I'm going to add items to it. So this would be, this would be the portion that you, you were used to EDOC importing. So I'm going to add my first item. It's 001, and this is just for robots. And if I had some other, so it says schedule ID, this could be, you know, some other software. Basically, this is another um, reference field that you can use for whatever makes sense to you. Um, and if you need these field names changed, this is something that we can do in eDoc support too. So if schedule ID doesn't make sense and there's another um, reference number that you want that to do, we can do that. So I'm going to leave that blank. And this is a contract for a 1,000 robots. They happen to be really cheap at this rate. Um, now, set is something also that um, you may not have been taking advantage of. Um, and I think when we get into the pay estimates, it will make more sense. So I'm going to talk about it now and let you know that it's something that makes sense at the pay estimate level. What this will do is it allows you to group the different levels or different line items on your schedule of value. So for this, I'm going to go ahead 
it obviously makes sort of, it's a little silly. I'm going to go ahead and make this the mechanical set. Um, and if I wanted to add a comment here, I can do that. So I'm going to go ahead and hit save. So there, I have one light item on my schedule of values. I'm going to go ahead and add a second. You guys love to watch me type. Robot controls, it's another thousand. And there we go, 10,000, I want to say mechanical. Now we have my second. And we're going to go ahead and add a couple more. So you'll see again, you know, if this is a 25 line item schedule of values, this is probably something you'd rather us import. Um, but it's super quick. Or, you know, if you're doing four or five, it's super quick. Another thousand robots. And my robot calibration happens to be $500 each. I'm almost done. Oh, did you see that? That's. Oh, three. So if I make a mistake, the way you can go back and edit it, and this is true too, if EDOC imports a schedule of values and you realize you made a mistake and you need to edit something, um, you can actually go in and do it. You don't actually have to, to call us and, and, and have us re-import it. So I can select the line item that I, that I added. I'm going to hit edit. And um, actually, I'm going to hit edit down here. And it brings me back. So this was actually line item number three. I'm going to go ahead and hit save. Now, you'll notice it also gives me a running calculation here. Um, of, so this is also a good thing to kind of keep track of. And it's something that we, we, when we import your schedule of values, like to make sure that your SOV adds up to your contract amount. So I've only got two more line items to add. This is 04, robot initiation, initialization, initialization, and another 1,000. They're getting cheaper. It's going to go ahead and say this is mechanical. Hit save. Look, I got one dollar to go. So this is number five. This is robot domination. At this point, right? I mean, the robots are going to take over. This one's going to be lump sum. And you know, price is one. This one also will be actually just for fun. I'm going to make this one electrical. So there, I've got my manually entered schedule of values, um, something that, that maybe you didn't realize you could do. Um, I can take a look over here, contracted items total, yay, those two things match each other, and I can go back. Um, and then from here, I submit it for approval. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to submit it to the owner of the Colonial Fleet, and then they can approve it. And then this, this one is ready to go. Once this is approved, then um, Greystone Industries, my contractor, will be able to create pay estimates against it. Um, and like I mentioned, this set thing really comes into play. It's very useful on pay estimates because what it will allow you to do is sort and group things by your set. So um, we've sometimes had requests on schedule of values like, hey, I want to have a sub-item. Um, a good way to deal with those sub-items or to, to roll things up and group them is to, to do that with the set field. Um, let's see. From here... Really, schedule of values, like I said, it, it laying the groundwork for pay estimates, which we will certainly touch on in another um, in another session. Contracts, like I said at the beginning, really lay the groundwork for a lot of other things, especially you know contract uh, linked items. We've had a lot of times projects will get going and they want to get a CCR in and they want to get a change order going, and when they go to create one, they realize they can't because there's not a contract in the system. So um, this oftentimes is the, the springboard to getting the rest of these things going. And with that, I'm going to turn to Samara and see if I've missed. Okay, we've got one question queued up. Okay. Oh, it's not. Okay. Well, what's the one question? You're muted, by the way. Yeah. So Tim asked whether or not um, you can upload an, a schedule of values from Primavera 6. Unfortunately, you can't. You have to um, submit it to us in an XLS file. And then he also asked if um, if he could do it himself, if he could upload it himself. Uh, unfortunately, that's something that the support staff has to do. And so, you know, if you're looking for kind of the format, we we've, we certainly have a, a page that we can send out that kind of gives you some guidance on the format. But if you're thinking about, you know, um, what the format is, really it's just take a look at the fields that are available to add. I've created a quick schedule of values here. Um, I, 
if I wanted to, I could have imported it this way. I'm going to make this one mechanical. I think this is what I did, and this was electrical. And I could save this workbook and send this to EDOC support, and this would be a format that we could upload. Um, one of the things that we sometimes get into trouble with with schedule of values is that people like to bold and format and, you know, turn these into dollar values and put formulas in. Um, and unfortunately, that's the type of stuff that we have to keep an eye out for. We really need this to be unformatted, as boring as you possibly could be, um, no, no formulas uh, as far as importing in. So sometimes if you find us going back and forth, that's some of the stuff that we're, we're wrestling with. Uh, the import routine likes plain old boring XLS. Um, spreadsheets to import. All right. Anyone else have any questions? Mm -hmm. I'll point out again for those of you who are calling from or, or working with the Iowa account, um, contracts work in a, in a, a different way in Iowa. We have them workflowed so they go through an approval process very similar to how pay estimates and change orders and things like that work within EDOC. Um, so you don't have the ability to just simply unpublish a, a, a contract and then make edits. Uh, because of that approval process, we have to create revisions on contracts. Any other questions? I am going to try to get back to, there we go. All right, one last thing before we go. We really thank you for coming to the session. Um, I hope it was useful for you. If you could please participate in this last poll, it gives us an idea whether or not um, <laughs> we're on target in selecting the topics. Go ahead and give us your feedback. And um, at the end of this, when you log out, you will also be you will also be I think prompted to give feedback. So if you have specific feedback on upcoming topics or things of that nature, go ahead and send it to us there. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Talk to you soon.